17-year-old Mary Opitz went to the mall with her mother and brother. After working their way through the mall, Mary made her way back towards the parking lot to wait at the car. When her family emerged moments later, the packages Mary carried were left neatly on the trunk, but Mary herself had vanished. Initially, police didn't take things seriously, assuming Mary had run away, until it happened again less than a month later. Mary Hare was waiting in the same parking lot, nearly in the same space, to pick up her mother after her shift at work. When Muriel stepped outside, the car was parked neatly, the doors left unlocked, but her daughter was nowhere to be found. Just like Mary Opitz, she had vanished without a trace. No signs of a struggle, no witnesses, nothing to suggest what might have happened. It wouldn't be until months later, when Mary Hare's remains were discovered, that investigators began to believe they may have been victims of the same killer. Mary Opitz has never been found, and without a direction to go, police began looking towards known serial killers who had been active in the area. They looked at Henry Lee Lucas, Otis Toole, and finally, their attention was drawn to Christopher Bernard Wilder. Might he have been responsible for one or both women's disappearances, or was there something else at play? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 162, The Disappearance of Mary Opitz, Part 2. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we'll be picking up where we left off in Part 1, examining the possible connections of serial killer Christopher Wilder. Before getting into the case, just a few quick notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at Trace Evidence Pod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash trace evidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Two young women gone from the same location. One found brutally murdered. The other remains missing. In desperation, police turn their attention towards serial killers active in the area with similar M.O.s. This is the disappearance of Mary Opitz, part two. In late October... Investigators questioned notorious serial killer Otis Toole about the case. Toole, who was in the state at the time, claimed to have no knowledge of either Mary, and investigators for the most part believed that to be legitimate. It wasn't really Toole's style. It didn't have the same signatures. But since he had been in the area and was a murderer, they wanted to cover all their bases. While Tool had been a necessary piece of the puzzle to either include or rule out, there was another serial killer who caught the attention of investigators, both for his whereabouts during the crimes and his typical approach to victims. Soon, he would capture the attention of the entire country. A brutal, violent, and sadistic killer was now entering the fray. An Australian national with dual citizenship, a millionaire with a flair for race cars and photography. He lived in South Florida and was in the state when both Marys were attacked. He was a man of many parts, but the most powerful of those was the cold-blooded monster at his core. You may know him as the Snapshot Killer or the Beauty Queen Killer, but his real name is Christopher Bernard Wilder. My name is Chris Wilder, been in Florida approximately 11 years, originally from Sydney, Australia. I want to date. I want to socially meet and enjoy the company of a number of women. Christopher Bernard Wilder was born on Tuesday, March 13th, 1945, in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia, and was the son of an American naval non-commissioned officer and an Australian national. His early years were spent bouncing around naval bases in the United States and Southeast Asia, returning to Australia after his father's retirement. Getting an early start, 
Wilder's first arrest came at the age of 17, when he convinced two boys to lure a 13-year-old girl into his car. From there, Wilder drove them to a vacant quarry where he raped the 13-year-old. Wilder would later receive probation for this crime based on the fact that both the magistrate and a psychiatrist believed that, with proper treatment, he wouldn't go on to offend again. Wilder would later claim that after receiving electroshock therapy, his violent urges were enhanced, though many journalists and researchers have failed to discover any evidence that Wilder received electroshock treatments at any point in time. Wilder married in 1968, though this would be a short-lived affair filled with violence and abuse. Wilder had apparently attempted to seduce both his wife's mother and sister, and according to her, he'd also attempted to kill her on two occasions. On Valentine's Day in 1969, Wilder was questioned about a sexual assault which targeted a student nurse, and he admitted to the crime, though when the victim refused to testify against him, the charges were dropped. Wilder's wife, leaving him after this admission, went to the Sydney police and explained that she'd found photographs of nude women in Wilder's possession, as well as women's underwear, which didn't belong to her. She accused Wilder of being, quote, the Wanda Beach killer. On January 11th, 1965, two Sydney schoolgirls, Marianne Schmidt and Christine Sharrock, both 15, were found dead on a stretch of Wanda Beach. The murders were brutal with Christine suffering a fractured skull, as well as being stabbed multiple times in the back and neck. Marianne was stabbed more than 15 times, including a deep laceration across her throat. Both girls were sexually assaulted by the perpetrator, who made no attempt to conceal the crime and left the girls exposed in the open. According to investigators, Marianne had been attacked first and Christine attempted to escape, but was caught down the beach, where she was killed. The assailant then dragged Marianne through the sand, leaving her next to Christine. This hideous crime kicked off a massive search involving more than 5,000 interviews. Wilder was one of those initial 5,000, though no charges were ever filed. Wilder's ex-wife's statement dated February 28, 1969, should have sent investigators immediately to his home, and yet for some reason, there was a massive delay in follow-up. By the time police arrived to question the suspect, nine months passed, and they came to learn that Wilder had left the continent in May of 69, emigrating to the United States where he settled in Boynton Beach, approximately 130 miles to the east of Fort Myers, Florida. In the U.S., Wilder gained success as a building contractor, drove expensive cars, and earned himself a reputation as a rich playboy. Over the next few years, he began employing a scam he'd used in Australia. Posing as a photographer and or fashion model agent, he'd approach young women in malls and other public locations, offering to photograph them and get them glamorous modeling gigs. Between 71 and 75, he faced several charges related to sexual misconduct. Finally, Wilder lured a young woman to his truck under the promise of a modeling contract, at which time he sexually assaulted her. Despite several convictions, Wilder never faced jail time and instead was given probation and mandatory mental health treatments, none of which made a difference in his behavior. In 1977, Dr. D.G. Boozer assessed Wilder, describing him as a, quote, mentally disordered sex offender, saying it was unsafe to leave him out in society rather than in court-mandated resident programs. But this assessment, it appears, was ignored as Wilder walked free when the charges were dismissed. Wilder lingered in and around Florida for the next five years before returning to Australia in December of 1982, visiting his parents for the holiday. Less than 24 hours after arriving, Wilder was out stalking the beaches again. Before the new year, Wilder was arrested and charged with forcing two 15-year-old girls to pose nude for him. Wilder's parents posted bail, $350,000, and for reasons passing understanding, he was allowed to return to Florida for so-called pressing business, promising to return for trial, though he would never set foot on Australian soil again, and instead, two years later, would embark upon a brutally violent spree crisscrossing the United States over a span of several weeks. 
It all began on February 26, 1984, when 20-year-old Rosario Gonzalez vanished from the Miami Grand Prix where she was working. As it just so happened, Wilder was there that day as a race car driver and competitor. Rosario has never been found. Just a month later, on March 4th, 23-year-old Elizabeth Kenyon vanished from the school where she worked in Coral Gables. Witnesses had seen her with Wilder that day. Elizabeth Kenyon has never been found either. When news broke that police were seeking a race car driver for questioning related to Rosario Gonzalez's disappearance, Wilder knew his time was limited and he was hell-bent on avoiding jail. On March 19th, 21-year-old Terry Ferguson disappeared from a mall in Indian Harbor, approximately 125 miles north of Boynton Beach. Her body was discovered four days later in a canal in Polk County, Central Florida. She had been sexually assaulted and was found lying face down. Just one day later, on March 20th, Wilder abducted a college student from a mall in Tallahassee. He wrapped her in a blanket, stuffed her in his trunk, and then took her to a motel where she was sexually assaulted and tortured violently until somehow she managed to lock herself in the bathroom, at which point Wilder panicked and fled. The following day on March 21st, nearly 700 miles to the west in Beaumont, Texas, Wilder approached 24-year-old Terry Walden on a college campus and proposed photographing her. Walden turned down the offer but was weirded out enough to tell her husband about it. That information came in useful two days later when on March 23rd, Walden vanished. Three days after that, her body was found in a canal and Wilder had evidently stolen her rust-colored Mercury Cougar. That same day that Walden's body was found, she had been stabbed multiple times. Police in Oklahoma discovered the body of 21-year-old Susan Logan, who had disappeared from a mall in Oklahoma City. Her body was found floating in a reservoir. She had been sexually assaulted, tortured, and stabbed. On March 29th, Wilder abducted 18-year-old Cheryl Bonaventura from a mall in Grand Junction, Colorado. Witnesses reported seeing a man fitting Wilder's description soliciting women for photographs at the mall that day. Two days later, Cheryl was shot and stabbed to death in Utah. Her body wouldn't be found until early May. On April 1st, 17-year-old Michelle Korfman disappeared from a fashion show in Las Vegas. Photographs taken during the fashion show revealed Wilder in the audience. At this point, the FBI elevated him to the 10 most wanted list, and a nationwide manhunt was underway. On April 2nd, Wilder abducted 16-year-old Tina Rosico from Torrance, California, sexually assaulting her and grooming her to assist him in his abductions. The two then began traveling east, staying in motels along the way. On April 10th, 16-year-old Donette Wilt was abducted from a mall in Merrillville, Indiana, with the assistance of Rosico. Rosico drove while Wilder sexually assaulted and tortured Wilt. Near Rochester, New York, Wilder took Wilt into the woods, where he attempted to suffocate her, but ultimately stabbed her twice, leaving her for dead. But Wilt somehow survived, and was able to tell the police that Wilder was heading for Canada. In Victor, New York, Rosico assisted Wilder in the abduction of 33-year-old Beth Dodge. Wilder took Dodge into his car while Rosico drove the woman's Trans Am. Wilder shot Dodge, killing her, before dumping her in a gravel pit. He then took Rosico to Boston's Logan Airport, where he purchased her a one-way ticket to Los Angeles and even waved goodbye to her from the gate. On April 13th, he attempted to abduct a woman near Beverly, Massachusetts, brandishing a gun. Luckily, she managed to escape on foot, and Wilder continued on his way, stopping at a gas station in Colebrook, New Hampshire. There, he was noticed by two state troopers who recognized the car from the FBI bulletin. As they approached, Wilder dove into his car, reaching for his three fifty seven Magnum. Trooper Leo Jellison leapt into the back, and during the struggle, the gun fired twice. The first shot passed through Wilder, striking Jellison in the liver. He would eventually recover. The second shot, however, ruptured Wilder's heart, and the vicious, brutal, and violent killer fell dead, his month-long murder spree finished. 
In addition to his known crimes, Wilder's a suspect in as many as 10 other murders and disappearances, including those of Mary and Mary Elizabeth. Given Wilder's presence in Florida, his tendency to approach potential victims at shopping malls, his use of a knife in several cases, and his direct targeting of younger women, he was immediately considered a person of interest in both cases. Wallace later told the news press, quote, We are definitely looking at Wilder as a suspect in the disappearance of Mary Opitz and the murder of Mary Hare. We are attempting at this time through the FBI to determine Wilder's whereabouts or even his absence during the time Opitz and Hare disappeared from the shopping center. End quote. In addition to Lee County, at least three other Florida counties began investigating Wilder in connection with unsolved disappearances and homicides. To date, he has only ever been ruled out in two of 14 cases for which he's considered a suspect. Lee County investigators referred to Wilder as their best suspect so far in the case of Mary Opitz and Mary Hare. However, to date, no solid evidence has ever been uncovered or revealed which can directly tie Wilder, let alone any particular suspect, directly to Opitz and Hare. Lee County Sheriff's Captain Tom Wallace later told the Fort Myers News Press that, with little evidence and no witnesses, the likelihood of solving either case was extremely slim. Over the years following Wilder's death, there are mentions of both Mary Opitz and Mary Hare, but they become fewer and further between. By 1990, Wallace explained both cases were personal to him, and he reviewed them often, but there had been few developments. In 2001, 20 years after Mary disappeared and Mary Elizabeth was murdered, both cases were considered cold, and while still open, there had been few advancements. In fact, police remained in the same place they had been for years. The crimes were believed to be connected, Christopher Wilder was a prime suspect, and several other killers were considered possible, including Otis Tool and Henry Lee Lucas, but there was neither enough evidence to link them nor rule them out. Six years later, in 2007, things hadn't changed. Sergeant Mag Nosbush, when interviewed by the news press, explained that Mary's disappearance remained as mysterious 26 years later as it had back in 1981, saying, quote, one minute, she was smoking a cigarette on the hood of the car, and she's never been seen again. There are some mysteries, and we keep working them. There's no statute of limitations on a missing person. End quote. This year marks 40 years since Mary Opitz vanished and Mary Elizabeth was murdered, and yet, after more than three decades, their assailant remains unknown. Speculation abounds. Could it have been wilder? Certainly some details, specifically their abductions from the mall, could fit his M.O. However, there were multiple crimes, similar in nature, committed against young women at that mall in the years before and after. In some of those cases, they captured the assailant. In others, they were unable to identify them. While it may be easy to believe Wilder had been responsible, not everyone agrees, including Mary Opitz's own mother. This past January... NBC News tweeted out an article explaining that investigators believe Mary Opitz could have been a victim of Christopher Wilder. Mary's mother, Nancy, replied to the tweet saying, quote, I still don't believe it was him. There is more to the story, end quote. She later retweeted that same article, this time writing, quote, this is my daughter and I don't believe it, end quote. Nancy is certainly not alone, as over the past 40 years, there have been many who felt Mary's disappearance is more likely tied to someone local, someone who stalked the mall for victims and may, in fact, still be out there continuing to target young women. Unfortunately, given what information we do have, the possibilities are almost endless. When last seen, Mary Opitz was described as being a white female with brown hair and green hazel eyes, standing 5 feet 4 inches tall and weighing approximately 105 pounds. Mary was last seen wearing a brown velveteen jacket, white pullover shirt, designer blue jeans, and brown pumps. Mary's ears are pierced, and she was wearing two gold bracelets and a gold necklace with a charm. At the time, Mary wore braces and smoked cigarettes. She has a scar between the fingers of her left hand. She was last seen between 7 and 7.30 p.m. heading out the Woolworth entrance of the Edison Mall of Fort Myers 
on January 16, 1981. She was carrying two boxes and a bag of pretzels, all three of which were later found stacked neatly on the trunk of her mother's 1979 Burgundy Camaro parked in a well-lit area near Woolworth. She has never been seen again. 17 at the time of her disappearance, if alive today, Mary would be 57 years old. A family trip to the mall transforms into a nightmare from which there's no escape. Forty years later, in the mystery of what became of Mary and who was responsible continues to linger. So many questions unanswered and disturbing possibilities considered. Yet, despite the passage of time, the investigation appears no closer to providing answers, and the families of both Mary Opitz and Mary Hare struggle to accept the grim reality that they may never learn the truth in their lifetimes. Despite the years, Nancy continues to hope that someday she'll not only find the answers, but her daughter as well. When asked about her daughter after all this time, Nancy replied, quote, It's every single day. You think about it every single day. Those days have formed all these years now. It's crazy to think about how long it's been. I can't believe she's not out there. Until they can prove to me differently, to me, she's alive. You have to keep hope alive or else how could anyone cope with this situation? You have to keep living your life, but you can't ever forget it. We all miss her dearly. Forty years is a long time to wait for answers. For the family of Mary Hare, they eventually received some semblance of an answer. Their daughter's body was found in the months after her disappearance from the Edison Mall. While they no longer had to struggle with the unknowing, they were left to confront the harsh reality that a monster had stolen the life of their daughter, and he was still out there somewhere. For Nancy Hoffman, she's never known what exactly happened to her daughter Mary Opitz. Was she abducted and taken, forced into sex work? Was she murdered and dumped but simply never found? Could she possibly still be alive out there somewhere, desperate to get home, but unable to find a way? To this day, despite all the odds, Nancy continues to cling to the hope that until her daughter's body is found, there is a chance she's still alive. It's not an easy disappearance to analyze, with almost no evidence available. The possibilities of what could have occurred are fairly vast. While in many cases there's someone police at least have to look at, someone with a history or a connection to the victim, here we don't really have anything. More so, I think, the area itself becomes suspect. As we established in Part 1, this was an era where malls were the place to be. They drew in people from all around, shoppers, kids looking for some place to hang out, couples going out on dates and everything in between. When you've got a place that draws such a massive confluence of different types of people, you're going to have criminals who see these popular locations as hunting grounds, as locations to stalk and seek out victims who may never see them coming. All you really have to do is look at the Edison Mall in the time leading up to the crime and the time after. There were attempted and unfortunately successful abductions and sexual assaults before Mary vanished, and there were attempts and successful attacks after. On the one hand, it may seem easy to lay this all at the doorstep of a well-known, established serial killer who was in the area and was known to target malls. But on the other, there's no more evidence to make that connection than there is to say the crimes were random, linked or not, and that the abductor and killer could have been almost anyone. Someone local, someone who worked at the mall, someone who knew either Mary or both. We also have to contend with the similarities between Mary and Mary Elizabeth questioning whether they were both independently targeted or if perhaps the suspect, assuming the same person committed both crimes, had a type or if there could have been the possibility of mistaken identity. As is almost always the case, the best place to start is at the beginning, making our way through what's known and seeing what links and connections can be established or dismissed. To begin with Mary Opitz and the night of her disappearance, viewing the initial crime scene as an isolated incident until we begin to examine the known facts of Mary Hare's abduction and murder. It was the night of Friday, January 16th, 1981, when Mary, her brother, and her mother made the quick drive from their home to the Edison Mall. Mary heads out to the car, parked in a well-lit area of the parking lot near the Woolworth entrance. 
Nancy would later say no more than five minutes passed between the time Mary left and she exited to find the packages left behind on the trunk of the car. According to what we know, no one saw anything strange, heard anything that would suggest an abduction took place, and there was no physical evidence left behind. So I suppose the first question becomes, how does someone manage to abduct a strong-willed, intelligent, physically in great shape 17-year-old woman without anyone in the surrounding area noticing? To me, there's a few basic possibilities. Either Mary was lured away by someone asking for help. A guy asks for directions, she approaches the car and gets pulled in. Or maybe a Bundy-style abduction. Person with an apparent injury such as a broken arm or leg seeks assistance and when she comes over, she's grabbed. There could have been someone Mary knew or recognized who was able to disarm her, asking for a lighter or to bum a cigarette. I also think you have to consider someone with a form of authority, be that mall security or police, someone who flashed a badge or displayed themselves as a trustworthy figure who got Mary to come along for one reason or another. It could have been as simple as saying something bad had happened to her mother and she needed to come right away, or maybe more targeted, accusing her of loitering or saying she fit the description of a shoplifter. There's also the possibility of brandishing a weapon. You know, the Fort Myers police captain argued that it was unlikely there was an abduction because of the absence of a struggle. However, if someone pulls out a gun and says, come quietly, will you really see much of a struggle left behind? As for the item she left, if she was grabbed, then that makes sense. If it was someone posing as a cop or a security guard, you could easily have said, I need you to come to the security office. My partner will gather up the items. This is what makes it frustrating. The truth is, there's a whole myriad of ways this could have gone down. And without anything further, it's almost impossible to rule any of them out. I think one of the most important details is the time frame. Nancy has argued that her daughter vanished in less than five minutes, while initial reports listed it as being as long as an hour, though that appears to be more connected to the time frame between Mary's disappearance and when police arrived to take the report. In all reality, everything likely occurred within a window of less than 10 minutes. Obviously, we've seen cases where people are abducted in less than a minute, so it's not to say that five minutes doesn't provide ample opportunity. However, I do think it could go towards answering a question I've had since I first began researching this case. Was Mary randomly targeted in the parking lot that night, or is it possible she'd been selected earlier in the evening and was being watched and followed? Sure, someone could have come up to her in the parking lot and saw the opportunity inside of that small time frame window, but I also think we have to consider someone may have seen her, even if only walking by herself when she began to leave the mall and from that moment set their plan into motion. I don't think this was random in the way that someone saw her, saw an opportunity, and took it. More likely, she herself may have been random in selection, but the person who abducted her likely was at the mall that night with plans of abducting someone. They'd have their plan already established, only needing to make adjustments based on location and the victim they chose. We don't know exactly what Mary did outside of the mall that night, though we do have a comment from an investigator years later describing her as smoking on the hood of the car. I can't help but wonder if that's an assumption, or if there is at least one witness who saw Mary outside of the mall that night. If it's the latter, that witness would be very interesting to speak with, but there's never been any mention of this person, if they even exist. There is, of course, the possibility that someone was cruising the parking lot that night looking for potential victims. We've had reports both before and after of men driving around that parking lot, following women, trying to lure them away. That certainly could have been going on here, and Mary just had the incredibly terrible luck of walking into the parking lot that night as such a person was coming through. I do think the time is interesting to note as well. This wasn't an abduction that occurred after hours when the lot was sitting out, but actually two hours before closing on a Friday night, when there's a good chance that cars would have been going in and out of the parking lot more than they did during weeknights. To me, that makes the abduction a bit more brazen and likely committed by someone who not only was comfortable with what they were doing, but also with where they were doing it. So Mary's gone. No witnesses, no struggle, no screams. Police, in their infinite wisdom, decide that of course she ran away. 
She's 17, carrying packages out for her mother, saving up money for a van, and studying for her GED. Why wouldn't she just run off randomly after a trip to the mall where she expressly noted being both hungry and tired? During my research, I came across an interview with John Walsh, conducted by the Fort Myers News Press in October of 1983, and I think he puts my feelings on the issue quite clearly, saying, quote, You take a girl past 12, and she's almost automatically labeled a runaway. Labeling a child a runaway would be signing that child's death warrant, end quote. I understand that, statistically, there's a lot of cases of runaways who leave of their own volition and return. However, I think some level of intelligence has to be applied here. Someone who leaves a note, takes their belongings and money, sure, maybe they went off on their own. Someone vanishes from a parking lot, taking only the clothes on their backs and nothing about it makes sense? If you're labeling that situation a clear-cut runaway case, then you've got no business wearing a fucking badge. People aren't just cookie-cutter shapes. Disappearances don't always fit the same mold. If you can't see the difference between the two, then you need a different job. I can't begin to imagine what answers might have been found had this case been handled as being connected to foul play from day one, rather than mostly dismissing it as a runaway situation. Less than a month later, Mary Elizabeth Hare disappears from the same parking lot on Wednesday, February 11th. Much like with Opitz, there's no struggle, no witnesses, nothing to indicate what might have happened. The similarities between the missing women is noted. Both physically resemble one another, speak with similar accents, and disappear from within feet of each other. Both are, at the time, outside, waiting for their mothers. While Mary Opitz disappears in a window of 5 to 10 minutes, Mary Hare goes missing inside a window of 15 to 20. While eventually both cases are investigated as likely being connected, no one really knows for certain if they actually are. For all of the similarities, there are some differences. Mary Opitz vanishes early in the evening, Mary Hare up close to closing time. Opitz is gone on a busy Friday night, Hare on a slower Wednesday night. Mary Opitz is outside of the car by herself when she's abducted, but Mary Hare is in her own car. While Opitz could have been grabbed or lured, Mary Hare had to be convinced to get out of her car. Rather than repeat the possibilities, every way in which one was abducted could be a way in which the other was. If this had happened somewhere else, a convenience store, library, grocery store, where there was no established history of similar crimes, I'd be more inclined to 100% assume there's a connection. Now, I'm not saying these cases aren't connected, but I am saying two women disappearing within a month of each other from a mall where several other women were abducted, attacked, or attempts have been made on them by different suspects makes it possible you could have two different assailants involved employing different techniques. While the smart money says they were linked, believing that above all other options could result in ruling out possibilities that fit into one category and not the other. So it becomes a question of, are we looking at what is most likely based on what little evidence we have, or are we making the leap of assuming that because the women were so similar, then the crimes had to be committed by the same person? It's hard to say for sure. We know perps were stalking women in that parking lot. We know in some instances they grabbed them, and in others they forced their way into the victim's own car. However, there's one really important detail about Mary Hare, which I believed has been overlooked. She worked at the mall. Her mother worked at the mall. She'd likely have had familiarity with the lot, the comings and goings, mall security, and people who hung out there. Whereas Mary Opitz could have been deceived by someone posing as mall security, Mary Hare was less likely to fall for that. I think we also have to factor in that Mary Hare's father was a police officer who, I imagine, drilled into his daughter's head the dangers of the world, especially with her working at the very mall that Mary Opitz disappeared from a month earlier. I don't imagine her buying into a trick or a lure, and to me, it seems more likely she'd have been confronted either by someone armed who forced her to come along quietly, or maybe someone she recognized and thought she could trust. I mean, put yourself in her shoes. You're picking up your mom. She'll be out of the mall in 15 minutes. You always lock your car. You're smart. You're suspicious. How does someone get you to walk out of the car, leave it unlocked, knowing your mother's coming? Probably not as easy as it would have been to take Mary Opitz. 
again, I'm not going to claim these cases aren't linked, but I will say they've never found evidence to directly establish one. Both women lived in the same area, at one point attended the same high school and moved in similar circles. Mary Opitz worked at the Mariner's Inn. Mary Hare often went there with her friends. Both women had ties to Bob Hoop, who in turn had ties to gangs and drug runners. Now, I tend to side with investigators that neither woman's crime is connected to the gang, nor the bar they allegedly spent time at, but I do think Hoop is the only true solid connection we have that links Opitz to Hare. It doesn't take a great deal of digging to find Hoop has an extensive criminal background, but he fades from the picture after 1982, and I can't help but wonder what he may have known, if anything. Looking towards the other persons of interest in the case, we've got familiar names like Otis Tool and Henry Lee Lucas. Lucas seemed to be active in Texas during the time these crimes were committed, though he's suspected in cases spanning from North Carolina to California during 1981. So, it's not entirely out of the question he could have been in Florida at some point in early 81, though there doesn't appear to be much to establish that. Lucas and Tool were both considered linked to murders taking place in Holmes and Washington County, Florida. Washington County is approximately 500 miles northwest of Lee County, where Mary Hare and Mary Opitz crimes occurred, and Holmes is next to Washington. So while both men are clearly in Florida around this time, they don't appear to be down in the Fort Myers area. That doesn't rule them out per se, but it doesn't directly connect them either. Tool was in and around Jacksonville during 81 as well, though this is also more than 300 miles from Fort Myers. For a lot of people, Christopher Wilder seems to be the best potential match, if indeed one or both cases is connected. Wilder tended to be more on the east coast of Florida, owning a home in Boynton Beach as well as land in Loxahatchee. Most of the victims for Wilder are from the east coast. Tammy Leppard out of Merritt Island, Colleen Osborne out of Daytona Beach. He's considered a person of interest in the March 7, 1984 abduction and murder of 19-year-old Melody Gay. Abducted during the pre-dawn hours from a 7-Eleven on State Road 951 in Collier County, this crime occurred less than 60 miles from the Edison Mall. Gay's body was found less than 40 miles from the mall in the Golden Gate Canal in Naples. Being that her point of abduction and the location where her body was found spans just 20 miles, it does bear similarities to Mary Hare. In addition, while Mary Hare was believed stabbed to death and sexually assaulted, Gay was strangled and sexually assaulted. So without a doubt, Christopher Wilder could have been stalking the Edison Mall. He may have targeted both Marys or just one. In a curious twist, we discussed the disappearance of Tina Beebe, who had connections to gangster and drug runner Harvey McElroy. In 2013, a body found years earlier in May of 82 was positively identified as being Tina Beebe. While her cause of death couldn't be determined, it was noted that her fingers had been severed, which made investigators believe hiding her identity was a conscious effort done by the killer to distance himself from her. For a long time, it was believed that B.B. was linked to the drug-running gang and had likely been killed in the aftermath of McElroy's murder. However, when her remains were found, they were on a plot of land in Loxahatchee, owned by Christopher Wilder. So now you can likely tie Wilder to Tina Beebe, which in turn ties him to the Fort Myers area in the early 1980s. We know Beebe also knew Hoop, who knew Heron Opitz. In addition to Beebe, an unidentified woman was also found in the same area several months later. While some of her characteristics fits Mary Opitz, there's enough variance there that it's likely not her. The absence of braces and different clothing being a part of the puzzle. She's also estimated to have been at least 22 years old, though I do think it's worth noting that no comparison has been attempted between this Jane Doe and Mary Opitz. In July of 82, another unidentified woman was discovered in the same area, floating in a canal alongside two men. She's described as being 18 to 25 and standing 5 feet 2 inches tall. Her clothing doesn't match Mary Opitz, and there's no mention of braces. Sadly, there are a lot of Jane Doe's found within 50 miles of the Edison Mall over the course of the next few years, and many of them remain unidentified today. According to NamUs, 24 comparisons have been conducted against Mary Opitz, and none of them have ever matched. So, 
Could Christopher Wilder be responsible for both Mary Opitz's disappearance and Mary Hare's murder? Certainly. However, he could also be connected to either one or neither. The frustration is palpable as while he fits in so many ways as a likely suspect, there's never been enough to make a definitive link. Perhaps if indeed Mary Opitz's remains were ever located, or perhaps have been located but not yet identified, there may come a time where answers can be discovered. Unfortunately, without more, it's very difficult to know what exactly happened that unusually cool night in January of 1981 outside of the Edison Mall in a span of 5 to 10 minutes. For what it's worth, I do think it's important to note that Nancy Hoffman, after all these years, is not 100% convinced that her daughter was a victim of Christopher Wilder. In online postings, she suggested there may be more to the story, and in an interview with Dateline, when asked about Wilder, she replied, quote, It's a possibility, but there are a lot of those. End quote. And so, that brings us to where we are today. A lot of possibilities and nothing substantial to include or exclude many of them. We've been through some of the bigger names that have ever been associated. Tool, Lucas, Wilder. There are others. Other names that were in the area and active at the time. Samuel Little, Oscar Bolin, Eddie Mosley, to name a few. It seems, tragically, that this period of Florida history was home to a lot of killers, abductors, rapists, and all other variations of men and monsters. Despite it all, Mary Opitz's name remains on the missing persons list. Her image is still out there, available to be viewed, and the details of her case are well known, though perhaps after the passage of time, memories have begun to fade. I do think one fact is clear. Someone out there knows what became of Mary, and who was responsible for the murder of Mary Hare. Unfortunately, without a break in the case, the discovery of Mary's body, an outright confession, or advancements in technology, the disappearance of Mary Opitz will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the disappearance of Mary Opitz and the murder of Mary Hare, there are many websites and news articles discussing their cases. Several documentaries about Christopher Wilder have been made, and they are mentioned in many of those as well. If you have any information about the disappearance of Mary Opitz or the murder of Mary Hare, please contact the Lee County Sheriff's Office at 239 477 one two zero zero. You can also contact Crime Stoppers at one eight hundred seven eight zero tips. That's one eight hundred seven eight zero eight four seven seven. I do want to add that I tried to get in touch with Nancy Hoffman for this episode, and I don't know if she saw my messages and decided not to respond, or if maybe they didn't make it through. But if you're listening, I would love an opportunity to speak with you to discuss your daughter, her case, and your thoughts on it. I imagine you have a much better insight into what may have happened, and if you'd like to speak to me on the record or off, I'd be more than happy to have a conversation. So if you're listening, please drop me an email at traceevidencepod at gmail.com or reach out to me on Facebook, Twitter, or anywhere else. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at traceevpod, message me on Instagram at traceevidencepod, Email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com or comment in the Facebook group. Trace evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers. Alicia Lorraine. Anne Bertram. Aurora Kay. Bacon Bits the Cat. Brittany Bivens. Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Dave Allen, Denise Dingsdale, Diane Dyson, Eric Sumter, Guillerme Pinto, Heather Louise, James, Jen Treb, Jennifer Winkler, Joni Berkwitz, Kara Moreland, Marla Wright, Melissa Brakizen. Nick Mohar Schurz, Orange Patches, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah Levonen, 
Sarah Mascaratolo, Sarah Lyons, Travis Skepko, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, Tracy Woods, and Walter Jansen. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or go to trace-evidence.com and click on the support option. That's going to conclude this week's episode. If you haven't already, please consider rating the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Five stars would be greatly appreciated, but it's up to you. Share these episodes, spread the word, and maybe together we can help bring justice to those who have been deprived of it. Thank you all once again for listening, supporting the show, and for being the best listeners a podcaster could ask for. Thank you again for listening to this episode. And I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.